Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, workshop. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some instabilities in non-classical transport work that we're doing in this particular regime, a partial ionized and partial magnetized plasma. Um, I'd like to thank all my students and uh, postdocs who have contributed to this. Um, so the contents of this work include just introducing plasma. I saw that I'm the first plasma speaker of this uh, you know, workshop, so I'll just briefly mention just a big picture of plasma physics and identify the region that I'm interested in. Uh, and in particular, there's this uh, unsolved problem called anomalous electron transport, and this is particularly important for plasma confinement because if you want to confine the plasma with magnetic field, but that's like you know dissipating all the particles and energy, then you're not trapping those particles. So we we have known this uh, you know phenomena for a long time. Uh, and the approach that we're trying to take is that there's recent like you know laser diagnostic studies indicating there's a lot of instabilities in plasma which we knew but like you know the coupling of instabilities can lead to this anomalous electron transport across the magnetic field so I'd like to talk about those uh, related to some of our work that we did. So this is kind of the famous plasma chart for those of you who are not familiar with plasma. Plasma is ionized gas which is also called to be fourth state of matter from solid to liquid gas to ionized gas. You put more energy. The y-axis shows you the electron temperature and the x-axis shows you the electron density. So broadly speaking, you can see that there's the bottom left, which is rarefied and low temperature. And you can also see the high temperature and high density. Note that one atmospheric pressure in like, you know, our Earth is like 10 to 25 for cubic meters if you use, you know, room temperature 300 Kelvin. So then you can categorize like, you know, this into two different categories. Um, I like to call this like bottom left corner to be low temperature plasmas. And the right corner is, you know, there's various names, but like, you know, just for comparison, you know, I'll call it high temperature plasmas. And the, re the research that we're interested in, my group, focuses on this frontier of the low temperature plasma phenomena. So the idea is by studying these, can we bridge the gap between these two distinct areas? So uh, let me get into a little bit more detail about my research, uh, core research area. So this is partially ionized, partially magnetized. What does this mean? If you have ions, electrons, and neutrals, then you can call it partially ionized. If you use all the neutrals and turn it into ions and electrons, you can call it fully ionized. So that's the first distinction. Partially magnetized means that if you have ions and electrons, both are charged species that would interact with the electromagnetic field. But if the ions are heavier, which is typically the case, and ions are typically non-magnetized and electrons are easier to be magnetized. So this is a particular regime that the electrons are magnetized and ions are non-magnetized. What happens is very interesting because from a technological point of view, the use of the applied magnetic field allows us to control the plasma. Like, you know, if you want to trap the plasma, you can make it hotter or you can make it higher density. But then there's a lot of different, like, you know, problems, like, you know, from a scientific point of view. The first is the multi-scale nature. There's high frequency that can span from gigahertz to megahertz oscillations. In our particular device, I'm showing you here on the right, the Hall effect thruster, which is a very common electric propulsion uh, technique that's even used for like in SpaceX, like, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, government agencies like, you know, NASA and DOD. Um, then you also have the low frequency oscillation. Then we can call this to be like self-organization patterns. So there's an interesting interplay between the high frequency and low frequency plasma oscillations. It's also multi-physics because there's collisional flow. If you have a gas flowing and you're trying to ionize, then it's an inherently collisional process. But once you have plasma that's flowing, then that may be collision less if the Neusen number becomes larger. So there's a transition of that physics as well. And then there's also multi-species, which I indicated when I was explaining the partially ionized aspect. So um, what goes into these partially ionized plasmas? Um, I just wanted to list you know, a few like, you know, physical and chemical processes. So the first thing is that if you have a neutral gas and if you want to ionize it, there's all sorts of different interactions, electron excitation, dissociation, vibrational excitation, ionization. But then you also have radiation, so we have to understand all these types and cross-section and the frequency. Uh, then if you have electromagnetic field, you can, uh, you know, it's always accurate to estimate or assume that it's electromagnetic, but in some certain cases, you know, you may assume electrostatic. 
Uh, then if you have industrial plasma, the key challenge between becomes a boundary condition because you want to confine the plasma in some kind of metallic or dielectric chamber. Then there's this like heavy species interacting with the wall, which may include different types of, you know, wall interactions. Now, if you have ions and electrons interacting with the wall, then you can have plasma wall interaction. And we have this phenomenon called the plasma sheath, which is like a charged, like, you know, particle boundary layer uh, type phenomena. Uh, there's a potential drop in the ion electron flux balance is determined by how the plasma sheath behaves. And this, you know, uh, is affected by the type of the material. You know, is, is there going to be electron emission from the wall? So th this is where the complexity comes from. And finally, all the gas, conventional gas dynamics effect, like where's the outflow, like where's the vacuum pump, and where's the inflow of the gas. So um, uh, this is my like, uh, research interest, uh, my main research interest. If you have the first principles gas kinetic equation, like Vlasov equation or Boltzmann equation, vlasov fokker planck equation, and this equation describes the velocity distribution function of particles, which is a function of position, velocity, and time. Uh, now, if you take the moment of the kinetic equation, then you can drive the fluid moment equation. Uh, in the fluid community, we know Navier-Stokes equation. The Navier-Stokes equation can be derived from taking the moment of the kinetic equation using like chapman anskog expansion. Then, if you look into the uh, fluid moment equation, this P double bar is the anisotropic pressure tensor. So we typically assume in collisional gas, you know, uh, regime that P is isotropic pressure. But if the VDF, the velocity distribution function, is not Maxwellian, then this becomes a tensor quantity. And then you can take the higher order moment. And this gives rise to the closure problem. Uh, so uh, different types of techniques are developed in our group and in the community. The first one is the fluid continuum models, which can include like Euler and Navier-Stokes uh, MHC equations which are numerically inexpensive because you're only solving for the macroscopic quantities like density, temperature, bulk velocity. But then if you want to know the non-Maxwellian nature of the particle VDFs, then you have to resort to kinetic methods. And one is the particle-based kinetic method, uh, which includes like particle and cell simulation, pick simulation, or direct simulation, Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo collision simulation. There's another uh, kinetic model, uh, which is a grid-based, what I call the direct kinetic method. So we can solve the Vlasic equ equation, which is a seven-dimensional you know, hyperbolic PDE, directly on a phase space. Uh, it has some advantages compared to the particle simulation. There's significantly less particle noise. So it's very good for studying like high-frequency plasma instabilities. But the challenge would be the computational cost when you want to develop the computational model. So uh, let me just briefly explain the uh, scientific uh, key scientific question that I want to raise in this uh, talk, which is the anomalous electron transport in partially magnetized plasmas. So as I said, if you want to use magnetic field and trap the particles, but we observe that the particles are being dis diffused, you know, much faster than we expect. So uh, this is from Frank Chen's textbook. Uh, 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 and it's in chapter five where he talks about diffusion. So, you know, you, you can talk about like two fluid models or you can combine them and derive the single fluid MHC equation. Uh, finally, you get some like flux relation, uh, uh, which is, you know, a diffusion flux, right? And this D perp is the diffusion coefficient across the magnetic field. And if you formulate the classical collisional theory, then you can show that this D perp is a function of the magnetic field and different plasma properties. But the key idea here is that the diffusion coefficient should be 1 over b squared, which means that if you increase, increase the magnetic field, then the diffusion should be less and less and less. But he also noticed, and a lot of different plasma physicists in different areas noticed, that this d perp from different experiments, different like simulations, and different theoretical work has been shown to like, you know, be uh, exhibiting poor magnetic confinement. And in the 1940s, Bohm and others uh, uh, proposed a sem semi-empirical formula called the Bohm diffusivity, or the non-classical non uh, you know, transport theory. And you can see that this scales is 1 over b. So what this shows is that you want to increase the magnetic field to confine the plasma, but it's anomalous being diffused. So uh, um, then I, I wanted to like, you know, just step back and like, you know, try to understand what this anomalous diffusion means from a plasma wave interaction point of view. So this is simple ODE salt, you know, system for particles. If you have electric field and magnetic field, 
you can study how the particles are moving. Then I'm interested in cross field devices, so I have a DC electric field and a DC magnetic field. That creates an E cross B drift in the negative Y direction. So if you just, you know, launch particles like in this system, you can get this gyro motion and an E cross B drift. And if you look into the guiding center, which is a center line of this trajectory, you can see that there's no particle going across the magnetic field. But then if you add collisions, then that kind of bumps the particles across the magnetic field. So that's what the classical transport theory describes. Now, what if there's an electric field, so plasma wave, in the direction of the E cross B drift? So I'm just assuming a non-time varying sinusoidal electric field in the Y direction. And if you run, ran, run a lot of simulations, then you sometimes see this like, you know, interesting particle trajectory. So you can see that it's heavily distorted because the particles are, you know, gaining energy from the wave energy. But then the guiding center, which was like around X equals zero, is now clearly shifted across the magnetic field. So this describes that you can collision less, you can transport the particles across the magnetic field in a collisionless manner. So this is where I would like to call, it's, you know, not turbulence from a fluid turbulence perspective, but turbulence from a non-classical perspective, that if you have plasma waves, and it can be 1D, 2D, 3D type plasmas, then the electron transport would be enhanced. So, oh, what, what, what kind of uh, instabilities uh, are, uh, you know, occur in partially ionized plasma? I'm just going to quickly go through this, like, you know, um, you know, there's kinetic instabilities of different types, which are like, you know, Bernstein waves and low hybrid drift waves, and also electrostatic instabilities, but you can also have fluid instabilities due to the magnetic field and like, you know, the gradient of magnetic field and ionization instabilities. All right, so uh, let me focus on first the kinetic instabilities. These are typically the instabilities that cause non-Maxwellian effect or which is caused by the non-Maxwellian effect of the particles. It typically, uh, you know, exhibits small wavelength and uh, high frequency plasma waves uh, relative to the fluid instabilities. So this is our work uh, internationally coming together and we wanted to have a PIC simulation benchmark. I'm not going to go through the detail, but again, the same geometry. There's an axial uh, um, uh, applied electric field and the in-plane applied magnetic field that causes an E cross P drift. This causes these small scale, like millimeter scale oscillation that moves in the negative Y direction. And we're able to now study the effect of the electron transport in the presence of these plasma waves. Uh, what we did further in this uh, recent study in PRE, we added some doubly charged ions which would create two stream instability in the axial direction. Now you can see the plasma wave is multidimensional and we were able to quantify the electron transport across magnetic field, which is shown in this slide. If you take the time average fluxes in the different directions, then you can quantify the contribution of the plasma wave to the electron transport across magnetic field. Uh, we also are studying the theoretical uh, aspect of the instabilities. So if you formulate the dispersion relation of plasma uh, in the presence of uh, singly charged ions, we're, we're interested in xenon ion in our community. If you have doubly charged ions, then you can have these dispersion relation contributions. Then if you have magnetized electrons, then you can have Bernstein wave kind of dispersion. And that changes between 2D and 3D. So if you do the 2D version of the a 2D solution to this equation, they, you see these like nice resonance mode, but that resonance mode disappears if you account for the 3D nature, which indicates that the growth rate is significantly damped if you go from 2D and 3D. So this necessitates the need of 3D pick simulations and other high order uh, fluid models. So uh, next is the fluid instabilities. I see that I only have a few more minutes, so I'll try to go quick. A uh, bit, uh, this is the fluid instability is based on fluid moment equations or the ensemble of particles. Uh, typically, these result in large wavelengths, so like, you know, self-organization patterns and low frequency oscillations. The two main low frequency oscillations on the order of like 10 to 100 kilohertz that we see in our device, the Hall effect thruster, uh, have, uh, you know, these two phenomena. The left is the azimuthally rotating spoke. So if you see this, like plas the bright plasma area, it's moving in the azimuthal direction in the E cross B device. And you can, this is just looking at the Hall thruster from the side. So now the plasma is generated from the left and advected to the right. This is like an advection reaction system where ionization instability is happening. So um, this is just uh, the model that we use for the fluid model. 
uh, we derived this fluid moment model um, and we, the key differentiation from other low temperature plasma model is that we keep the inertia terms so we can study the electron inertia effect. We use these, uh, you know, uh, CFD tools like, you know, global lax free reflux splitting, muscle reconstruction, uh, SSP Rangikuda 3, and boundary condition, as I mentioned in the first part of our talk, of my talk, you know, we use a different kinetic flux treatment, which I'll be happy to go over this, you know, if uh, anyone is interested. And this is the paper that we, uh, you know, explain this numerical model. Taking this numerical model, then we can study interesting plasma phenomena. So as I mentioned, one of the two low frequency plasma oscillations that we're interested in is called the rotating spokes. And this is just a toy problem to demonstrate that. We have a plasma in the box and this is a conducting wall absorbing the part charged particles. There's a cross magnetic field into the page that causes electric E cross B drift and diamagnetic drift in the azimuthal direction. And from our simulation, we were able to reproduce this rotating spoke that is occurring in the minus E cross B drift direction, which is uh, contrary to the understanding in our community. There's a lot of people believing in what's called a Simon Hall instability, but we believe from our simulation and theory that the rotating spokes is driven in the diamagnetic drift direction. Uh, uh, two more uh, instabilities that I wanted to introduce. During my PhD, I worked on another type of instability, which is related to the breathing mode, which I showed the plasma generated and advected generated, advected. It's like, you know, predator prey, a uh, lot of Volterra type model. So if you have ion density, neutral density, it's going to be exchanging its information through the right hand side, which is the ionization term. Ions are generated, neutrals are depleted. But these rates is determined by the electron temperature. So what we did in these uh, series of work is to include the electron temperature equation and then formulate the linear perturbation theory we were able to show that the electron temperature perturbation is needed for the ionization instability and the energy balance through, from the electrons will be able to control uh, these oscillations. Uh, finally, this is just, you know, a little bit different, but we're also interested in other interfacial problems. Just wanted to pitch this idea because, you know, this conference is about interface. Uh, what we did was revisiting this uh, uh, instability called the tonks frankel instability. If you have charged fluid liquid and if you uh, have external electric field, then the electric field, the surface tension and gravity balance would lead to stable, uh, you know, uh, a liquid per, uh, protrusion or it can make it unstable. So we did formulate this shallow water model and then we were able to show that our shallow water model coupled with the electric field solver gives nice agreement with this Tom's Franklin instability that was proposed like 50 years ago. Uh, so just to summarize my work, uh, you know, there's a wide range of linear instabilities that have been proposed that are being studied, but the key challenge in our community, in my opinion, is the coupling of the instabilities. If you have different instabilities and different multi-scale, like low frequency to high frequency, how are they interplaying? Which is causing which? Like, you know, what's the causality and what's the consequence? So that, that, therefore, the theory becomes a little bit, you know, difficult to detract because of the nonlinearity. This is where we believe that the computational models, both in the kinetic and fluid aspects, are helpful to understand the non-classical transport. Uh, we're also applying it to different types of dynamical plasma problems. And we're, I talked about fluid model and large-scale kinetic models, but we're also interested in model data fusion as an alternative. Uh, thank you so much. In your uh, anomalous transport, did you consider drift wave transport? I didn't see that. Yeah, drift wave is it's basically the same thing in my opinion because you know there's a E cross P drift that's causing you know the uh, instabilities. Uh, you know the the way that we formulate is probably different from you know the, the fusion or like you know a fully ionized plasma community. Um, you know we we haven't we, we read the papers but we you know we wanted to study uh, with our two fluid model. Okay. Can you get a mic, take the microphone? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, when you show like the, when you show like the, um, when you've got like the growth of like the electron instability with like the two stream instability, 
you you show like you got like the modulation due to the presence of the Q stream instability. But ah. is, there's like an interplay, or they just like grow independently. And the thing is like about like the non like the saturations. Right. Since it's like the electron instabil instability, it will go like it will reach like the saturation way faster than the Q stream instability, which is like ion instability. So is it after like the saturation we still like? Have an interplay between like these two instabilities. Yeah, so this is already the saturated state oh, after the saturated. linear instability. Uh, so you can see that the the waves are all fully grown in you know the two directions. Yeah, okay. And you know the growth rate in this case happened to be like you know not too different. So that's why we were able to see that you know we we get the saturated state. But depending on the plasma density and profile, then you might get like you know the electron cyclotron drift instability and ion ion two stream instability to be in a different growth rate. But yeah, in these, you know, cases, we, you know, th these are both saturated states. Okay. Yeah. And how, how, like, what is the interplay with, like, in Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question because, you know, I didn't show the detail, but there's like a inhomogeneous electric field and inhomogeneous magnetic field. So it's really hard to pinpoint, like, you know, this is where ECDI occurs and this is where IITSI occurs. There's kind of a reason where both can interplay. It's really difficult to quantify that effect. In this paper, we do allude to that, you know, suggesting that there can be interplay between the two. It could just be also like a decoupled two instabilities that you have one instability in the y direction, one one instability in the x direction, and through the electric field, you know, it's ca causing a global like an almost electron transport. So the question, I think, is you know, related to the global effect and local effect as well. Yeah, thanks. Is it possible to diagnose in plasma, like, you know, any link between the topology of the interfaces that develops, especially when there are some, some instabilities, and what is going in the bulk, between the structure of the flow fields in the bulk? And the topology of the interface or the dynamic of the interface that appears over there? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and so its connection to the, to the fluxes, is it like, you know, any relation between this? Yeah, I, I, so this is, for instance, just the electron flux that's time average, and the, you know, the arrows indicate the electron streamline. So, you know, if you think about this to be like different fluid element moving in different regions, by tracking this, like, you know, interface in the problem, then we may be able to get more insight. The challenge for like part of any particle in cell simulation is the statistical noise to clearly define that like you know interface that is moving in space and time. So this is the you know the the approach that we chose, but I think it may be possible. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and also this is why I'm interested in both the fluid and kinetic model by introducing high order fluid moment model that can capture kinetic effect. Then that you know the, those results may be better to capture those interfaces better. Do, do you see parametric instabilities in your PIC codes? You were talking about coupling between the different uh, types of modes. Do you see that? Yeah. So this is probably related to maybe this, like you know how the different instabilities are coupled. Um, you know. Uh, like, is the parametric instability you're talking about more in the context of like laser beam? Like well, plasma? Well, well, there's a standard parametric instability where you have a high frequency right. mode that will decay into two low frequency modes where the oh, some, sure. some of the frequencies of the sure. low frequency modes I adds see. up to the high frequency mode. And yeah. that, that's well studied I mean, some, thing. Some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, some people do uh, invoke like inverse cascade, you know, to be like, you know, one of the mechanisms that high frequency small scale oscillations lead to low frequency large scale oscillations. But this is also 2D simulation. So I'm on the, uh, you know, the, the side of like not trusting inverse cascade. You know, if you do 3D simulations, then okay. we have to see if there's like, you know, that kind of parametric instabilities. Okay, I think it's a different thing, but we'll talk after. All right. Yeah, okay, good. thank you. Okay, I think we're ready for our right, thank next you. speaker.